Hi. In this video, I'll demonstrate some basic calculus concepts using an analog computer. I'll compare the solutions from the analog computer to the same solutions using a modern digital computer in a computer algebra system. This will also demonstrate the requirements for scaling in an analog computer. In calculus, there are basically two main concepts. One is the derivative, and the other is the integral. A while back, in a, I watched a video series from the Great Courses, and one of the highlights of that video series was that the integral is related to the area under the curve of a function, and the derivative is related to the slope of a function at a given point. And those are some of the concepts I want to try to demonstrate with the analog computer. So first of all, we need a function to work with. Typically, in a calculus course, you'll start with the derivative function, and only later will you work with the integral function. With the analog computer, that's a little bit reversed. The analog computer works based on the function of the integral, so we'll start with that. And the basic starting point will be integrating a constant. So you can consider the constant uh, in the analog computer as a constant function. The independent variable in an analog computer is usually time. So when we look at the display, the horizontal axis will be the time axis, and the vertical axis could be whatever parameter you want to analyze with the analog computer. So first, I need uh, the constant function. And to generate the constant function, I can simply use a reference. We'll take the positive reference into potentiometer 1. And then we, in order to view that constant on the output of the analog computer, we'll need to run that through one of the amplifiers. So since I will not be using these for the actual demonstration, uh, amplifiers 7 and 8, I'll just use those to actually view the constant function. I mentioned in an earlier video one of the uh, basic ideas in the analog computer is that each computing element, each amplifier, will not only do its amplification and its integration and its summation, but it also always has an inverting function related to that. So the technically the first amplifier here will invert the constant function, but I want to invert it again so I can see the normal positive function. So that's the basic setup to get the constant function. It will be visible on output 8 of the analog computer. So first of all I'll go to pot set mode with pot 1 selected here, and I can adjust that to the value that I want to integrate. And to keep things simple, I'll just use a value of 1. Now, it reads 0.1 on the meter, and that's because the meter is, is just a scaled version of the output. So the reference voltage I'm looking at is, to, is actually a 10 volt reference. 10 volt times 0.1 on the potentiometer gives us the value of 1. So now I could run to operate mode, and all of the channels right now are going to be 0 except for 7 and 8. 7 is the inverted function uh, that we just generated with the potentiometer, but really it's channel 8 that I'm interested in. That is the uh, positive going uh, constant function, so it's a constant 1. So you could look at this as uh, f of t equals 1. So it's 1 over the entire uh, range of the function. Of course, that's not very interesting. What we really want to do is integrate that function. So what we need to do is take the output of amplifier 8 and apply that to the input of amplifier 1. Amplifier 1 is configured as an integrator and that's based on this jumper block down here selecting the capacitive feedback and the initial condition is unconnected so that would be held at zero. Now we can look at the output of channel one but it doesn't really uh, illustrate what we want to because of the inverting function so what I'll do with that just for the purpose of demonstration is take that inverted uh, 
output and just invert it one more time using amplifier 5, which is unused here. So this will just provide another uh, gain of negative 1 and convert that signal to the what you would normally see in a modern computer or if you did the integration by hand. And now we can look at the output of channel 5 is the integral of the constant function 1. And that's what I want to start with uh, as far as our analysis goes. We'll, we'll take a careful look at this and just think about what this really means from the perspective of calculus. So next we'll take a closer view of the oscilloscope screen. So now let's take a closer look at the output of the analog computer. As I mentioned, the oscilloscope uh, is calibrated for 0 to 10 on the horizontal axis and then minus 10 to 10 on the vertical axis. We generated the initial function which is really just f of t equals 1 so that is a constant function with a value of 1 throughout the domain of the function and we can read that on the analog computer with the oscilloscope output so we've got two minor divisions here and that's 0.2 units per minor division so that would be 0.4 of the entire division and each division would be 2.5 units so 0.4 times 2.5 gives us the value of 1. When we integrate that we get this function as the output of the integration and that we can take a look at a few interesting things about that function. If you remember from algebra, this is uh, considered a linear function and it's got the old y equals mx plus b format. Since we're dealing with t as the independent variable, you can think of this as f of t equals m times t plus b. Well, first of all, m, what is m? I think the easiest place to analyze that is at t equals 5. So we're, you know, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 divisions in. We are 2 divisions up, and it's 2.5 units per division. So that uh, vertical value is also 5. So that's uh, a vertical value or f of t value of 5 divided by the value of t which is 5 gives us 1 and that's important the slope of the line is 1 and it's a linear function so the slope is 1 throughout the entire uh, domain of the function the y intercept here which you know this would tip actually be the y axis it's not like a typical situation where you have the y-axis in the center. We're only interested in positive values. So here uh, is where t equals 0 and that crosses the y-axis also at 0. So in the y equals mx plus b, you know, thinking of it that way, b would be 0. So our actual function with m or the slope being 1 and b the the intercept being 0, the function ends up being f of t equals t. So for whatever value of t you have here, the value of the function is t. It's a linear function. So as we already looked at it here, when t equals 5, the function equals 5. When t equals 1, you can see we are two minor divisions up, and just as we calculated with the initial constant functions, two minor divisions times 0.2 gives us the 0 0.4. 0 0.4 times 2.5 gives us the value of 1. So when t equals 1, the value of the function is 1. When t equals 2, we're 1, 2, 3, 4 minor divisions up. And that 4 minor divisions times 0 0.2 gives us 0.8 and that times 2.5, 0.8 times 2.5 gives us 2. So when uh, t equals 2, the output is also 2, and so on throughout the uh, function domain.
So let's take a look at what that means in calculus. So what that tells us in calculus is that the integral of the constant 1 or the function, if you want to think of it that way, is f of t equals 1. The integral is f of t equals t. And I'm not going to go into the details. It would take quite a bit of time to explain that in terms of calculus. But that's a, an interesting point to remember. And that's one of those rules you'll just, if you are already know calculus or if you learn calculus, that's one of the fundamental uh, rules that are just remembered. Uh, you know, the function, the... Uh, Effectively, it's the integral of a constant is that constant times the uh, independent variable. So one, if, since the constant is one, it's one times t, or t is the integral. But another way to look at that is the integral is the area under the curve. So the integral function gives you the area under the curve of the original function. And this is easiest to see with a constant function and its integral. So here we see at... If you uh, think of uh, the area under the curve as the area of this rectangle defined by the function itself and the horizontal axis and then the a vertical bar at whatever time you're interested in and another vertical bar at t equals zero, well that's simple. We can look at that as a rectangle with uh, units of one in each axis. Of course that would be a square. It doesn't look like a square here on the oscilloscope because it's not the scale. The scale of the horizontal axis and the vertical axis are different. Nonetheless, that is a one by one rectangle in the, with the scale of the oscilloscope. And when we, of course, one by one would give you an area of one. And when we look at the integral function, We've already looked at this, but that value at 1 is 1. So that is the area under the curve. Two minor divisions times 0.2 gives us 0.4 times 2.5 units per major division. 0.4 times 2.5 uh, results in the 1. So now let's take a look at it at the center. We have t equals 5, you know, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 divisions times our value of 1 gives us a rectangle with an area of 5. And then when we look at the integral, it's now at t equals 5, the integral is 2 divisions up. So that would be 2.5 times 2 gives us the result of 5. So that's a pretty good... Uh, comparison and that's the same holds true if you graph this out and you could do this in Excel or in any uh, computer algebra on a graphing calculator you'll find the same results. So that's one of the interesting results of calculus is that the integral function gives you the area under the curve of the original function. Now we could also look at the derivative with the analog computer but what that relies on is the fact that the integral and the derivative are considered inverse functions. That comes basically from the fundamental theorem of calculus, is that uh, if you have one function is the integral of the other, you reverse the order of the functions and you have the derivative. And the interesting thing about the derivative is the derivative tells you the slope of the function. So if we look at the function in front of us, we know from algebra that the slope of that function is a constant. It has the same slope throughout its domain. And we've already uh, taken a brief look at this, but at t equals 5, you have a value of 5 with you know two divisions times 2.5 units per division. So the slope is 1, and that slope would be the same wherever you want to look at it on the function. Of course, at t equals 10, we're up 4 divisions and uh, the four divisions times 2.5 gives you 10. So 10 over 10 is one. And of course, we've already seen this, but if you think about the derivative of a function with a slope of one, the derivative will be one. And that's exactly what we have. Now that's what we programmed in, but that gives you a, a good visual representation of the inverse relationship
between the integral and derivative functions. Here on channel 8 we have the, the constant function 1. We take the integral of that function and we have the linear function 1 times the independent variable t plus 0. In this case our constant of integration if you will is 0. But if we go backwards and we integrate this formula, we're back to the, or sorry, if we take the derivative of that formula, we're back to the constant function of 1. Now, for comparison purposes, we'll take a look at the same concepts on a modern digital computer with a computer algebra system. So here, I'm running MathCAD Express on a Windows 10 computer, and I've got a basic uh, notepad or notebook set up. I did a little bit of housekeeping earlier just to set some things up so we could uh, go through this a little more quickly. I've got the independent variable t defined for a range of or a domain of 0 to 10 with a step of uh, increment of 1. And then down here I've just got a couple of plots set up. This plot here is to see the full value of the functions and then this plot is more representative of what you would see on the oscilloscope as the output of the analog computer. So we'll take a look at these functions uh, as we uh, integrate some of the various functions. So the first thing I'll do here is the same thing we did in the analog computer. I will define our constant function. So when I enter the 1 for our initial f of t, uh, I had it set up so this would plot on our uh, two plots down here. This initial plot, because we'll get, be getting into higher values, you barely see the line above the uh, uh, horizontal axis. But over here, it was more like what we saw on the oscilloscope. We have a, a constant value of 1, so it's about 0.4 of a division. And you can see I've got 2.5. Uh, units per division, so that corresponds to what we saw on the analog computer when we generated the constant function. So the first thing we want to do is set up the integral of our constant function, and I'll just call the integral f1 of t, and we will define that in the digital version. We have to define our uh, domain, so that will be from 0 to t, or our integration range for the definite integral. If you're familiar with calculus, this should all make sense. If not, just kind of follow along and you'll see uh, that we'll get the same results. And what I plan to integrate is our function f, but I'll have to use a dummy variable. That's uh, typically how we do that in uh, calculus. So f1 of t equals the integral from 0 to t of f of x with respect to x, f of x dx. Now, we have that function plotted down here, and uh, it actually is a linear function, but again, in this plot, it's a, uh, we, we will end up with much higher values, so we don't see much there. But here's what I wanted to show here is I will do a scaling test, so we need to find out how to scale this to make it fit on the oscilloscope or in the range of the analog computer. And to do that, I simply divide the maximum range of the computer by our function at the full value of the analog computer, which is 10, and of course this function actually fits in the range without any scaling, so we could look at that as a scale of 1. So now that we have the scale factor, I can define the scaled function, and I'll call that f1s of t, and define that as f1 of t times the scaling factor, which in this case it doesn't really do anything. Uh, Sorry, that was a typo there. Uh, but that defines the function. And now the function we saw on the analog computer is plotted for us on the uh, second plot down here. And you can see we get precisely the same results at t equals 10, f of t also equals 10, and at 
t equals 5, f of t equals 5, exactly as we saw on the analog computer. And here I'll just uh, go ahead and, sorry, uh, calculate f1 scaled of 10 equals 10. So we see that that reaches the maximum value of the analog computer at t equals 10. So this illustrates that you can get essentially the same results from the analog computer that you'll see on a digital computer. Now, an interesting thing, of course, in modern computers, the digital computer is much faster, much easier to work with, and much more intuitive, especially when you use a nice computer algebra system uh, like I'm using here with uh, MathCAD Express. Uh, but, of course, when analog computers were uh, in full use, this was back in the, especially in the 50s and 60s, even almost into the 70s, digital computers were a lot slower and a lot less uh, user friendly, I guess would be the word. So uh, it took a lot more work to enter these kind of functions and a lot more time to get the results. That's why analog computers were preferred in a lot of cases. They have virtually instantaneous results where now we can get virtually instantaneous results even from a digital computer. So now we'll uh, take it up a notch and see what the integral of a linear function looks like. Now we can continue the process and integrate the linear function y of t equals t and see what that produces. So let's take the output of the first integrator and apply that to the input of the second integrator. Now, if you notice, the overload light came on immediately. And uh, I wanted to do that to show, uh, to highlight the requirement for scaling in an analog computer. If we now look at the output of uh, amplifier two, we can see here that the uh, well before the time variable gets to the, the end of the domain or the, the uh, visible range on the scope, the vertical signal has gone off scale here. So that's why scaling is required. So what we have to do is uh, basically scale the signal to fit on the, within the parameters of the analog computer. Now, there's a few different ways of doing that, <laughs> and it, from the literature I've read, sometimes that's done by trial and error, and sometimes it's done based on a knowledge of the uh, problem at hand. So I'll kind of look at that both ways. I know from calculus that the integral of the function y of t equals t produces the function, uh, the integral function y of t equals one half t squared. So at the point out here where t equals 10, one half t squared would be one half 10 squared, uh, one half of 100 or 50. So what we have to figure out is how to make 50 fit into the uh, range of the analog computer, which is just 10. Well, 10 is one-fifth of 50, so we have to multiply the 50 times one-fifth or times 0.2. So instead of going directly from the output of integrator one into the output of integrator two, we go into one of these potentiometers for scaling. Now I can come off of the wiper of the potentiometer into the input of integrator 2, we can go ahead and switch over to pot set mode and look at channel 2 and then set that to the scaling factor of 0.2. Now when we go to operate mode, you can see we're well within the range of the analog computer. When t equals 10, we're right at 10 on the uh, oscilloscope, as we talked about, four divisions gives us the 10. But then we have to recall that we've scaled that by dividing by 5, so effectively we have to multiply it by 5. Another way of looking at it is we 
multiplied it times 0.2, so we have to divide that answer by 0.2 to arrive at the actual answer of 50. So to explore that a little more and to explore the uh, concept of integrating a linear function y of t equals t to arrive at a quadratic function effectively or a square function, uh, we'll take a closer look at the oscilloscope signal. So now we're back to the close-up view of the oscilloscope signal and you can probably recognize the function that basically looks like a parabola or half of a parabola starting at t equals zero. As I mentioned briefly earlier, uh, technically this is one half t squared. That is the integral of the linear function t. We can take a look at that in a little more detail and remember this is with the scale factor of 0.2 uh, by looking at it here at t equals 5. We'll go back to the linear function uh, at t equals 5 we had the uh, value of 10 and back to the concept of the uh, or excuse me, the, at t equals 5, the linear function was also, the value is also 5. As I mentioned, the integral gives you the area under the curve. If you think about this function, we are starting at 0, and then we reach an excursion of 5 at t equals 5. And that function, along with the horizontal axis, creates a triangle so that we know how to figure out the area of a triangle through geometry and algebra and that would give us uh, the base times height divided by 2 so we have 5 uh, times 5 would be 25 divided by 2 is 12.5 so let's see what that looks like on the integral so here on the integral function at t equals Five, we are one division up so one division is 2.5 units but then remember we scaled this by dividing the, the entire function by 5 that's what that scale factor of 0.2 was so what we have to do is take that 2.5 and then multiply it by 5 and of course 2.5 times 5 gives us the 12.5. So that shows that the integral gives us the area under the curve. So this value, which is effectively 12.5, corresponds to the area of this triangle, this 5 by 5 triangle. So that's 5 times 5 divided by 2 gives you 25 divided by 2 or 12.5. So that's another demonstration that the integral produces a function that gives you the area under the curve for the function in question. Now let's take a look at the derivative and this is maybe a little trickier to see on the oscilloscope because the oscilloscope is not to scale anyway so we have a excursion of minus 10 to plus 10 so that's an excursion of 20 here in the vertical axis and only an excursion of 10 in the horizontal axis so you know what's square in real life won't look necessarily square on the uh, oscilloscope but let's take a look at that on the uh, the derivative of this function will give us the slope at a given point so Again, going backwards, this would be the derivative of the 1 half t squared function. And that, since this has no scaling here, the uh, so let's say the derivative at t equals 5 is, in fact, 5. And you kind of have to use your imagination here, but if you could imagine... When we talk about the slope of a curve, that would be a, the slope of a line tangent to the curve is another way to think about that. So if you had a line drawn that just came and grazed that curve, uh, it should have a slope of 5. And that's probably going to be a little hard to show on the uh, based on the oscilloscope just because, one, it's hard to imagine that line, and two, we've got effectively two or 
more than two units in the in the uh, y direction for every one unit in the x direction. But I think you get the idea. If you did draw a line uh, tangent to that curve right there, specifically at that point, that would go up uh, five units for every one unit across and we can kind of see that uh, but again with the scaling it's a little bit difficult to see uh, so I'll leave it at that and we can go back to the uh, digital computer and take a look at that in the computer algebra software so here back in MathCAD we'll try to integrate the uh, F1 function to go from the linear function to the quadratic function. So my function, I'll just name it F2 of t, and then define that again as the integral from zero to t, but this time the integral of F1 of t Sorry, I use my dummy variable here, f1 of x, dx. And now you can see we've got the, uh, you can probably recognize a little bit of curvature in this red uh, plot that's shown up, uh, or red trace that's shown up on the plot. Now let's double check our scaling. Again, uh, we just divide the maximum ex excursion by the maximum excursion of the function. And this agrees with what we came up with earlier on the analog computer. We need a scale factor of 0.2, which is one fifth. So now F2 scaled of T is going to equal F2 of T times that scale factor of 0.2. And now that's been drawn in here on the plot to look like the oscilloscope. And you can see it looks exactly like what we saw earlier on the oscilloscope screen. It uh, crosses the uh, vertical line here at t equals five, right at the first division which is at 2.5. And that agrees with the uh, math we did earlier. And then we can see uh, F2 of 10, sorry, typo there, equals 50. But what I meant to do there was look at F2 scaled of 10 equals 10. So we get the correct value here at the end as well. So that red line on this plot appears identical to the plot that we saw on the uh, analog computer output on the oscilloscope. So that confirms that the digital computer gives you results in line with what we see on the analog computer. One thing I wanted to illustrate here, uh, it's a little tough to see on this, uh, at this zoom level, but I'll bring it in a little bit. And you can start to see, especially down here where the slope is, uh, you know, increasing on the uh, red trace there, you notice how these are in sort of segmented lines there. And that's another reason in the early days that the uh, analog computer was seen as an advantageous to the digital computer. The digital computer works in discrete units, whereas the analog computer works in continuous units. So especially in the 1950s, 1960s, when computers weren't as fast as they are today, these days I could go much faster just by changing the, or get, get a much higher resolution, I should say, just by changing the step to 0.1 instead of one. But back in the 50s and 60s, that would, you know, take an extreme amount of time to go to that resolution on a digital computer. So this was about the best they would expect out of a digital computer.
Uh, so that's why to get the uh, finer detail uh, as far as the resolution goes, the analog computer had an advantage there. So I'll go back to the analog computer and we can continue the integration process uh, a couple more steps. We won't go into the detail that we've done here, but I'll just plot the functions so we can see how those compare over here on the digital computer. Now we can continue the process of integration further and further on. It's uh, interesting, I probably should uh, back up a little bit and say, you know, in, in calculus, there's a couple of ways of looking at this, and usually this is related to a physics problem. If uh, this function we're looking at right now is the position of, a, of an object, then the um, derivative of the position is the velocity, and the derivative of the velocity is the acceleration. So in this case, we have an acceleration of 1, and the velocity is basically t, and then the position function is 1 half t squared. And of course, as you do these problems in physics, that's the, the general uh, concept you would follow. So those, that's kind of one of the physical relationships. Now, going further, it's, you know, in this particular case, or th that particular example, I'm not, you know, sure if it makes any sense physically to go to another uh, integral, but we'll go ahead and do that just for demonstration purposes. And we'll go from the uh, output of uh, integrator 2, and I'll go straight into the output of integrator 3. And here, of course, we see the overload situation because we're going even higher on the uh, output of uh, integrator 3, well in fact in this case it's going to be lower because there is the inversion there. And I wanted to do that to demonstrate another way to set the scaling is just experimentally uh, sorry, in process here. Of course first I have to use the potentiometer. So instead of going directly in there, I'll go to potentiometer 3 and then come off potentiometer 3's wiper arm into the uh, input of integrator 3. And then we can uh, adjust that for what we want to see, you know, the maximum excursion on the oscilloscope and that's in the ballpark and then what I'll do is go ahead and uh, oops, excuse me wrong knob take a look at the setting and interestingly that it's actually happens to be 0.3 so to go to the third integral we need a scale factor of approximately 0.3 and you know you'll see that played out in the digital uh, example there so we go back to operate mode and again, just because I don't like looking at these things inverted like that, even though it doesn't really cause any issues with the problem, I'll take the output of integrator 3 and put that over to the input of uh, the amplifier 6 to give it another inversion there. And then we can look at the corrected or you know, re-inverted signal there out of amplifier 6. Uh, and then just in the interest of time, we'll go ahead and uh, move ahead to, to another integration of that. So we can take the output of uh, integrator 3, and I'll go ahead and go first into the pot because we know we're going to need some scaling, and bring that into the uh, input of integrator 4. Now here we don't need run it through an inverter because we're, we're working with the inverted version coming out of 3, so the inversion of 4 effectively undoes the inversion out of integrator 3. And now if we look at the output of integrator 4, we can bring up the uh, gain or attenuation effectively in this uh, uh, with this potentiometer, so this is the scale factor between integrators 3 and 4, and 
again, we go to pot set, and you can see it's roughly four, uh, four there, just eyeballing it on the scope. So I'll set it to precisely four, and that brings us up to our uh, peak up there at 10. And again, that will be confirmed in the uh, when we look at it on the digital signal there. So we've got you know full it, four integrations going on here, which is a little bit beyond what you would normally do. But again, we'll go back and look through the signal. So we start with the uh, constant function of t, or sorry, f of t equals one, and then that integrated effectively gets us this uh, linear function. We integrate once more and we get a power of two function. Uh, then we integrate the third time, we get a power of three function. And finally, we integrate for the fourth time and get a fourth power function. So you can see the uh, steepness it is effectively um, much greater, but you got to keep in mind when we look at that on the oscilloscope, the scale factor comes into play, so it doesn't look like it's going much higher, but we'll see that uh, when we take a look at that on the digital scope. But let's take a closer look on the oscilloscope first, and we'll look at that now. So now I'll take some quantitative data off the oscilloscope, and we'll compare that to the results on the digital side. Uh, first of all, we'll take a look at the initial input, which was our constant function. And I'll just arbitrarily look at this at t equals 8, because uh, I can get a pretty good reading on all of the signals there. And that uh, is on about the second subdivision there, so we'll call that uh, 0.4 of the 2.5 units per division there. Uh, then we can uh, look at the next function, which is the linear function. And there at uh, t equals 8, it's not quite up to the, uh, you know, that's 1, 2, 3 divisions, not quite to 3.2, but maybe 3.18, we'll call it. And then we can go to the quadratic function. And let's see here, t equals 8, that's crossing right at the center to my eye, so we'll call that uh, two and a half divisions. Uh, then we'll go to the uh, third group. Uh, or sorry, power of three function. And that at t equals eight, it looks to me, I'll, you know, might be a little bit below, but I'll just call that two divisions even. And finally, the fourth power uh, function, which is on the fourth integral, and that looks like about 1.6 divisions, maybe call it 1.59. So we'll take those numbers and plug them into the digital uh, computer and see what kind of comparison we get. Just, just take a quick look at the accuracy of the analog computer. So here we are back in the digital analysis. Uh, I've gone ahead in the interest of time and filled out the you know, remaining two integral functions that we ran on the analog computer. And I thought I'd just mention a brief uh, issue on the scaling. Uh, because each you know, subsequent function in the analog computer works from the previous function, the scaling, I guess the way I would put it, it's accumulative. So when we scale function three, we've got to take into account the fact that the earlier function already had the, uh, the scale factor uh, that was applied to it. So it's already effectively that much of it's taken care of. So that's why uh, when I create function three, which was just the integral of the uh, quadratic function we had, uh, I just take the integral of function 2 in the exact same way, but then when I scale it, I go ahead and take the scale, or when I calculate the scale, I should say, I take the scale factor uh, from the uh, previous function and just apply that uh, to, the, to this function in order to calculate it. And you can see we arrived at that point 3, which is what we 
arrived at experimentally on the analog computer. And then when I, for comparison purposes, when I uh, look at the scaled version, I actually, uh, because in this case, it's not automatically working from the scaled function, I go ahead and apply uh, both scale factors on each subsequent uh, function here. And then here, this just shows that at, at 10, we get 10, so that the scale factor checks out. And, you know, the same thing was done here for uh, the fourth integral that we did. We just take the uh, integral from the third integral, integrate it in exactly the same way. Then to calculate the scale factor, we apply the two previous scales down here, and that uh, spits out the scale factor of 0.4 that we came up with on the analog computer. And again, we just take uh, all of the previous scale factors into account on this one because we're just doing it as an individual uh, scaling. So uh, from here you can see, and I won't go back and forth, uh, but you can see that you know we we have basically the same signals that we're seeing on the oscilloscope over here, but these are really what they would look like. And of course on the the uh, fourth integral we're getting up into the range of 420. So obviously that would be way beyond the, the range of the analog computer. And that's why we need to apply all these scale factors. So here we've got the constant function is the straight line down here. The linear function, which was the integral of the straight line. Then the quadratic function is the integral of the straight line linear function. Then we've got the third power function, which is the integral of the square function. And again, the fourth power function is the integral of the third power function. So you can see as we integrate uh, each, the power of each function goes up by one. You could look at this as a power of zero function since it's a constant. Uh, and here you can see the segmentation of those lines because I'm only actually calculating at 10 points is uh, noticeable down here in this uh, um, steepest curve or trace on the plot there. So now we'll take a look at those numbers and I've already gone ahead and done the math to do the uh, percentage calculations. So as you recall, uh, and this kind of makes sense because that's the one we set up, with four tenths of a division, that was two subdivisions times 0.2 divisions per subdivision gives me 0.4 subdivisions on the constant function. So of course, at any point, it's going to equal the same thing. And that's times 2.5 units per division gives me the one. And of course, when I take uh, f of eight on the constant function, which was the function we originally uh, defined, f of t equals one, well, it's going to give you one wherever. So there, it would make sense. We're not going to have any error whatsoever because that's our initial setup but in the linear function that's where you know we start seeing a little bit of difference there so I if you recall I measured 3.18 divisions um, on the oscilloscope times 2.5 units per division and again this one had no scaling because it fit within the uh, range of the analog computer and that gives me 7.95 now, when I run the digital calculation at 0.8, it's actually 8. So it's not off by much, 0.05. And that translates, when you do the math, the error function, you know, uh, the, this value minus the targeted value uh, divided by the targeted value times 100 in percentage, the error is minus 0.6%. And I think that would be on the order of what you would expect from uh, some analog computers uh, in the uh, back in the 50s and 60s. And we can do the same thing uh, on the second. Uh, this would be the quadratic uh, function. We had 2.5 divisions, but here we had the scaling. So we had 2.5 divisions times 2.5 units per division, but now we divide by the scaling to undo the scaling, so to speak. And that gave me a measurement of uh, 31.25 still you know it doesn't look that bad just looking at it there only 0.75 off but when you do the uh, 
uh, percent calculations, it's uh, minus 2.3 uh, percent, and that's fairly significant. Uh, one thing I would mention, I, I haven't actually gone through and done a full system calibration on this Comdyna GP6 after receiving, you know, after purchasing it off of eBay. There's a pretty complex calibration process that I have not bothered to go through yet, but that might be interesting to run that calibration and see uh, how close we come into the, or how, how tight I can bring in that uh, error there. But there'll always be some error, and that, of course that was the trade-off with the analog computer. Uh, it's fast and has very high, effectively infinite resolution, but it's uh, not, not as accurate. You can make a digital computer to whatever accuracy you want just by adding bits depending on how much money you want to spend. Uh, but uh, this is a little bit beyond, 2.3 is beyond, I think in, in the 50s and 60s, they'd say, well, it's time to recalibrate our equipment or look for the source of the error if it got as high as that. And one thing I've read is uh, they have to keep in mind that the a lot of times these were dealing with some pretty complex physical mechanisms and like temperature, uh, you know, heat flow, that kind of thing. So their measured values were not even within plus or minus 10%. So they weren't looking for, you know, 0.001% accuracy. Uh, so finally, the this is our, uh, moving on the third uh, or the power of three function. We had um, a measured value on the oscilloscope of two divisions times 2.5 units per division. And again, here I divide by both scale factors since they both come into play for this result. And I get 83.83 and a third, basically. Uh, and the actual value with the more accurate digital computer is 85 and one third. And when we do the math, that's actually coincidentally off by the same amount. So maybe all of the error between those two are uh, tied into one, you know, adjust, you know, one amplifier adjustment possibly, but uh, it's interesting. Those are both, you know, the same value. And then finally, the fourth one, I had 1.59 uh, units or divisions on the oscilloscope, 2.5 units per division. And here, of course, I divide by all three scale factors and reach a value of 165.6. The true value would be uh, 170.7 with an error of basically 3%. So that's, you know, that's definitely getting up there. So that would be a, uh, you know, it will be interesting to see at some point, I'll go through and calibrate the machine and see if I get any better results. But that's as far as I'm gonna go. This video has gone on for a significant amount of time here. So I uh, hope you enjoyed that. It's kind of an interesting comparison of an analog uh, computer to a modern digital computer and some of the uh, facets of each type of computer and what kind of results you can get out of those. So thank you for watching.